exactly. So I'm really excited and very grateful that we have here with us today uh, Bärbel Höhn, who's a uh, member of the Green Party in Germany, member of the German Parliament, the Bundestag, and chair of the Environment Committee, and so very well versed in climate change issues, climate change politics, and also mitigation and adaptation side, both of these aspects. I'm very glad to have you here today, and just a short announcement. Um, Babel Hearn has to leave at 12 um, sharp, so we will have her keynote and then short follow-up question and answer, and then we'll move right away into the panel and say goodbye to Babel Hearn. So thank you very much. <laughs> Give it. Hand of applause to Bevel Hearn. And uh, you can speak here at the podium, and I will give you the pointer. Yeah, and, and I will open. Ah, okay. Yes, so thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, uh, I'm not only the chair uh, of the committee on environment, but also in charge of climate protection, and even maybe it's important for this panel, um, city planning and buildings. You know, so yes, I would I would like to tell you a bit about our experience and our climate policy in Germany. So, if we are talking about the Paris Agreement, I think it's very important to have the goals in, in your mind. The global warming must be uh, to well below two degrees and in the future not to decrease more than 1.5 degrees. So, um, uh, well below two degrees, for us that means climate neutrality in the second half of the century. And that means for industrial um, countries like Germany that we have to decarbonize until 2050. And to decarbonize until 2050 is very um, ambitious. Uh, we are now on the path not of uh, two, um, uh, uh, two degrees, but we are on the path of 3.4 degrees. And that means we must be more ambitious than all the sum of the NDG, uh, um, ND, NDCs altogether. And even in Germany, we decided to talk about the new goals and what does it mean for Germany after Paris. Yes, and even cities, um, they are very uh, vulnerable. Uh, they have 2% uh, of the Earth's surface and half of the world's population. And uh, the problems inside the cities are culminating. Um, and that means because a lot of these cities are very close um, to um, coastal regions, uh, they have problems with the sea level rising. Uh, but um, also, for example, we had a study in Germany that our cities um, will be 10 degrees warmer than the surrounding of the cities. That means if uh, there's um, global warming, we have a, a special problem, uh, high temperature, 10 degrees higher temperature in the cities. And that means we need other sorts of planning our cities and uh, uh, have to look for other solutions. And so I think it was very interesting to, and very important for us uh, to have this uh, UN habitat in Quito because all the cities could come together and make an exchange of the experience we have in, in all this, um, maybe in the solutions we are talking about, you know. Yes, yeah, so if we uh, will um, solve our problems of climate uh, protection, we have to do it in the cities too. Cities, um, uh, on the other side, we have a lot of, um, of people who have a lot of innovative uh, ideas in the cities, and so it's a place where we can look for, for new um, innovation and uh, maybe new technology. But, um, you know, um, yes, because we have uh, very important actors, but, you know, we must have a better city planning because um, in the past we didn't think about climate, um, climate crisis and we didn't think about a cl uh, global warming. Uh, that, that means we have to talk about our, how to produce our electricity, 
we have to talk about our public transport system. It must be better and more attractive for the people to use that and not, not cars. And even the, the, the cars we have must be um, electric cars in, in the future, you know, and even, for example, I'm living a lot of time in Berlin because I'm a member of parliament, and so it's very important to have uh, more space, for example, for, for bikers, you know. So, for example, in the last 10 years, when I uh, started my, my time in the federal parliament, so yes, I went by bike to the parliament, and that were some, some other bikers, but now, when I'm now going by bike uh, to, to the parliament, there is uh, stop and go, you know, so because we have special um, streets for bikers, and sometimes we are staying there to cross the next uh, road, and we are staying 10 or 20 bikers all together there. It's a bit like in, uh, in other countries um, where you see a, a lot of bikers or motorcyclists, but in, in, in Berlin, especially uh, the bikers. And uh, I think that's an alternative, even in, in the cities, and um, so what we need is green um, uh, buildings on the other side. Um, so we, we must combine heat and um, and power um, uh, systems, we, we must, for example, use more uh, solar uh, on, on the roofs um, to uh, give the people who are living in the apartments of these buildings, give an opportunity to uh, reduce the cost of electricity. So we are just looking for a mix of uh, solar electricity from the roof and on the other side from the um, um, energy supplier. Um, but that means, uh, for example, cooperatives. Um, so um, there are new, a lot of new ideas to solve this uh, problem. But on the other side, we even need more parks, more trees, because we need more shadows, you know, and um, a, a better air situation. So yes, we, we have, and maybe we have to talk about if we are building up new houses, why not wooden houses? Because we can catch the CO2 in this wood, and on the other side, we can avoid cement, and, and so maybe a double impact for uh, climate protection. Yes, and uh, what, um, what is uh, Germany doing uh, for um, CO2 reduction? So we, we started in 1990, with that CO2 emissions, and then we reduced our CO2, CO2 emissions in about 25 years of, of about 27%, but that means 1% per year. But if you are looking to 2050, it's not ambitious enough, you know? So we have a national goal, that's not Kyoto goal, that's not EU goal, but a special ambitious national goal, and we decided for that 10 years ago and so we said we must reduce our CO2 emissions till 2020 of about 40%. And now you can see that we will not reach it because um, we have to reduce in the next four years 13% CO2 emissions. And um, so it's three times more ambitious than, than the last 25 years, you know. But um, um, we, the next step is very ambitious too because um, after Paris, we have to reduce our uh, goals uh, till 2050 of about a reduction of about 95%, and that means we have to reach this this part, this um, this part, not that one. That is um, only 80% reduction, but that is 95% reduction, um, percent reduction, and um, that means uh, that we um, have to look for really new solutions to reach this goal. And if you, we, you can see what are the very problematic um, um, sectors, especially that one, uh, coal-fired power plants. Um, so we have to shut down not only our nuclear power plants, but also our coal-fired power plants. Uh, we have a lot of problems, for example, with our transporting system uh, because we didn't have a really reduction of in that sector the last uh, 25 years. And even the, the building sector, we must be more ambitious. And that means we have to combine all the three sectors. And I think we need more electricity because we need it more for the traffic system, but also for the heating systems too, you know? 
So, and, and that means we have to look at the electricity sector, and um, you can see we started with our energy transition 15 years ago, and uh, now we have a part of renewables of about 30%, and uh, the latest data is not 30%, but 33%. Uh, so we have now especially wind, but also biomass, uh, solar, uh, photovoltaic, and um, the 3% hydro we had uh, 50 years ago, too. So that's um, old renewables, but the others are new ones, you know. So we reduced our nuclear part of the mix of about 35% 15 years ago to 14%, so 20% less now nuclear, but also our lignite part and hardcore part we had uh, 15 years ago, 55% uh, uh, lignite and hard, hard coal, and now only 42%. Uh, so we had a reduction of more than 10% in the last um, uh, 15 years too. And um, natural gas would be good to have more of that, but uh, it was in the past, it was very expensive. We have now a time that more and more uh, natural gas uh, plants are, uh, could um, run. And so maybe it's a better situation for climate protection, better to have gas as a bridge technology than, for example, lignite um, power plants. Um, but that's not all, because sometimes you say, oh, what are you doing, you Germans, with all your high energy prices? Yes, we have high electricity prices, but, um, you know, we paid for the whole world, um, because we paid um, the development uh, of the new technologies of renewables, and so I think we gave a gift to the whole world. Now you can use this very cheap uh, renewables in, in all countries, and um, that's done. For example, the reduction of photovoltaic in the last 10 years was about 80%. And with our Renewable Energy Source Act, we gave an, an guarantee for photovoltaic that was installed 10 years ago for the next 20 years. So we have to pay for the next 10 years, so 10 years left, for the next 10 years is very high prices of the first photovoltaic plants. But you can now use the very cheap ones. So our burden is, is your profit, you know. But that's not, um, I think we had a profit and a benefit in Germany too, because for example, we created 370,000 new jobs. So that is a really, uh, a job creation, creating machine, and we have now the technology the whole world wants to have, and we can make the plans in other um, countries to do that. And even we have 1.5 million people who are prosumers, so they are producing energy and uh, they are consuming energy, and that's why we uh, had this dynamic, and that's why we have. Uh, such a support from the population, for example, in the polls, 70 to 80 percent of the people in Germany like the German transition, although they have high energy prices. And I think the very important point of our energy transition was not the increase of renewables, but um, we put the energy production in the hand of the people. And that means electric power to the people, you know, so we could reduce the influence uh, of, of big uh, energy companies uh, because now the people are producing the energy and not only the big energy companies with a huge impact uh, they have on the government. So, um, yes, so very important uh, questions for Germany is um, phasing out coal. We have to phase out in, in the next, we as the Greens would say, in the next 20 years to phase out coal. The conservative parties would say in the next uh, 35 years phasing out coal. But, um, you know, we have to phase out coal. And that is uh, the decision the, uh, political, the, uh, the politicians in Germany did. And even you heard that we, um, um, showed um, here on the, on the conference our, um, our NDCs and on the, our long-term goals till 2050. Um, yes, but on the other side, I think we have to, um, to save energy and to look for more energy efficiency. And even, as I said, we have to combine all the sectors. And we have to look for agriculture, too, because we have to reduce um, climate um, 
climate uh, critical emissions in agriculture sector so, too. Why are we doing all this? There's no other planet B, so we have to make our solutions here. My generation has caused the problem, so we are the only generation we can solve this problem. So I'm staying here uh, looking for my children and grandchildren and would like to, ha to make a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to sit or stay? Yeah, you may sit down if you, if you want to. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Berbo, for this great, well, both looking at the trajectory and then also forward looking what needs to be done still. And since we have you here and since you are really, you know a lot about politics and policy making and the processes behind it. And me personally, as a, as a German living in the United States, we can't really just fully ignore the elephant in the room, right? Do you want to share any family-friendly thoughts about the recent uh, election in the United States and what you make out of it as a pro-climate motivated policymaker or politician with regard to the future pathway and what we can do from there? Mm -hmm. You, you know, I think it's a, uh, it's a good sign here from the conference that, that all the countries said um, we are very ambitious and we um, decided in, in Paris and we will go our, our way, although there was an election in, in the USA. You know, I think that's a first very important message. And so I think uh, Trump maybe can can block the renewables, but he can't stop the renewables. Uh, even, for example, in Germany, we have a, now a phase of about maybe the next one and a half years where um, the government uh, now blocks the renewables because we have the last fight, fight of the fossils, you know. And um, so in some countries we will have, um, yes, all this discussion we have now in, in Germany, we will have it in, in the USA, but for example, we have a lot of, con of connections to, to California, and a lot of states in the in, in USA will go ahead, and, and uh, they are very ambitious. So yes, we have, have to make more contact with them, and with them. And and when I remember, uh, Trump um, was visiting the agriculture states in in um, in the US in, in America, um, but in Germany, the farmers they were the winners of the process because they can install wind turbines on their fields, they can install photovoltaic on the roofs of their stables, they have biomass, you know. So maybe in, in some, some years or months, he remember that he is doing a poli policy against the vo his voters, you know. So um, um, Kerry said um, there will no change in the climate policy uh, from the US because the market wants renewables. So. Um, be optimistic. I think um, it's the best way to overcome problems. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Babel. We do have a microphone over there, a uh, portable microphone, so we can actually take, uh, depending on how long they are, two or three questions here in the room. Please state your name. Please keep it short and to a question and allow <laughs> enough time for Babel to answer. And uh, please, we have the first question from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Tozi. I'm uh, coming from Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, thank you, Honorable Member of Parliament, for that uh, very brilliant presentation. I just want to zoom in on the last part of the chairman's path, the, the reducing of uh, animal, uh, not necessarily animal, but agricultural uh, uh, GHGs. I wanted to find out, since this one, this particular COP is a COP of implementation or COP of action, is there a, uh, a sort of a protocol that Germany has, uh, has applied to change the behavior of its citizens? We know now that we have won in terms of uh, uh, cars and people are riding bicycles, but there's an element that we miss, which is sustainable diets or sustainable production of foods. Is there, is there a uh, campaign that is currently run in Germany to, to look into sustainable diets 
Uh, I'm asking this because last year in South Africa, in Cape Town, we introduced Green Mondays, which uh, focuses on uh, healthy living and plant-based foods. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, we would like to, to solve um, the, um, the climate crisis, we need the local level, and that means we need the cities. And so in Germany, we have a lot of cities who are going ahead, you know, and even in, in the whole world. So sometimes because of the mayors or because of the parliaments are very engaged. And so we have a lot of cities, they decided, for, exa for example, Berlin, you know, our, our main city, um, they decided, um, to reduce the CO2 emissions till 2050 of about 100%, so be fossil free in 2050. And uh, so all these cities make plans inside um, um, their, their policies, what can they do to reach this, this goals? And uh, there are a lot of different ideas. Um, uh, as I, for example, told, um, Berlin is very active in, in this, um, um, uh, transport sector, so the, um, the number of bicycles are increasing because, for example, uh, young men, in, in the past, when I was young, the men came with a car and asked, would you like to join me? And now they come with a very, very uh, important and, and, and very expensive bike, you know? Would you like to join me with your bike, you know? Or maybe with an electric car. So that changed a lot. And even in, in, in the different sectors, um, uh, transportation, uh, buildings, but for example, also agriculture. Um, so if we are talking about what the people are eating, you know, so it's a bit more that the old, um, not all of them, but some of the old men, they are eating too much meat, you know. But the young people in Germany, many of them, they are vegetarians. Uh, and, and so, because in the past, meat means I'm rich, you know. And after the Second World War, the people said, oh, I would like to be rich and I can eat meat, yes. And now the young people, uh, they are not interested in, in that because they have everything, you know. So they were growing up. Uh, with meat, and so they don't need that. Um, so there are a lot of initiatives, even in the cities, um, uh, to um, to change, for example, agriculture. Uh, we, we make a lot of urban gardening now, small projects. Um, my favor is small scale projects, you know, because uh, you can integrate the people, the pe people can participate at the process, and that's with our Renewable um, Energy Source Act. Uh, that's why we are so so uh, successful with it, because we gave the people the possibility to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. I think here the gentleman in the center. Can we reach him? Thank you. Hi. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, Hugh Johnson with Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the U.S. Um, oftentimes, Philadelphia isn't considered a coastal city, but we actually have two tidal rivers that run through the heart of our city. So. Um, given the fact that many adaptation strategies do have mitigation co-benefits, but you know capital is scarce at the city level, what recommendations would you give to city governments trying to balance between you know, spending money on adaptation strategies to protect their citizens versus spending money on something that's purely a mitigation strategy, which they will see you know, a limited benefit from, even though it's a global benefit? Uh, you know, I think mitigation and adaptation, and what, uh, where is uh, the main uh, perspective on it, I think that is especially the situation. For example, if you are living in a city in, uh, on the Philippines, or even, for example, um, New York. So our climate experts said that the Hurricane Sandy um, wouldn't happen uh, without a climate change. You know, so that is the result of climate change. Um, and, and that means especially the cities that are very um, close to the, the coast and, and, and the ocean and the sea level, they must do a lot of things uh, um, with um, adaptation. Um, but on the other side, um, uh, we have to do our work with uh, mitigation because if we don't reduce our CO2 emissions, we can't solve the problem, you know. So I think we are now at a at a time that we need um, to spend money for adaptation too. I, I thought maybe 10 years ago, mitigation is very important and not adaptation be because 
we we can't solve the problem with it. But um, I, I didn't think that, oh, for example, the extreme weather, the, the typhoons and, and hurricanes and, and the, the drought and so are coming so fast, but they are now here and we have to react and that means we, we need money for adaptation too. And, and how can we integrate the two? How can we actually leverage what you mentioned, the co-benefits, so adaptation measures that benefit mitigation or the other way around? Do you know, is there, I mean, it's not a simple question, there's no simple yes. answer, but if you want to maybe give a perspective on that, how to move forward, because that's kind of the, the hard not for the future, yeah, that's the tough question. Um, you know, most of the cities, they are growing, so more and more people are coming in, inside, and I think if we make a city planning for these new um, people who are coming, we must have these two aspects in our mind. Uh, because if we make um, city planning, um, that, uh, for example, uh, for, for, for buildings, maybe new buildings, uh, city planning for new buildings um, that, are, that are not so very close to, to, the, um, to the sea level, you know, or for example, we are looking for, for, for new buildings that um, where the, the big part of the roofs are to the to the sun side, you know, so we have a better, um, better, better efficient um, possibility for photovoltaic um, electricity. I think we have to combine this in the plannings, um, in, the, in our city plans. Um, maybe that is uh, one one idea, but but I can't give you the the idea. For, for all the, the problems. So I think we must be more uh, creative and, and maybe we have to exchange our experience because there, maybe there are a lot of solutions in different cities, but nobody knows about that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, good good uh, closing words also for the session because that's what we are about. We have panelists from the United States, from Europe. And I'm really sorry, but in the interest of making the time uh, 12.45 for the photo shoot in the end and your schedule, we will end the keynote here, but you can, um, in the slides, you've seen the contact details and you find them also online for Bebel Hearn and her office to get in touch with her. You can also get in touch with us, of course, for follow-up questions. We'll be glad to continue that discussion online, on Twitter, Facebook, etc. And I want to thank you again, and let's give you okay. a round of applause. <laughs>